and get going. Um, so uh, welcome. Uh, as I said, it's been a crazy day. Um, uh, today, uh, we're going to be speaking about uh, lecture four of the Applied Category Theory course uh, at MIT, the IEP course um, from 2020. And uh, this lecture um, focused on two major topics. Uh, the first was kind of a, um, a second closer look at uh, funk doors. Um, and uh, this included some discussion of functors from a mathematical standpoint and from a computational standpoint, um, defining them within, uh, within Haskell. And uh, uh, that discussion took a look at several specific types of functors um, and tried to situate them in, in terms of the definitions uh, given earlier. And I want to talk about a few aspects of that. Um, it also led to some back and forth between the instructor, uh, David Spivak, and uh, members of the audience that uh, offers um, some opportunities for reflection. Uh, the lecture then went on um, to discuss uh, natural transformations a bit. Um, and depending on how far we get today, uh, we might or might not uh, be getting to that within this uh, within this session, but we're certainly going to be expanding on natural transformations uh, in quite some detail within um, you know the, the the next lecture. Um, okay, um, so maybe I'll I'll uh, just note that the um, the material for today uh, is includes some overlap with what we saw last time. And I'll try to reinforce some of the things that we would have seen last time, uh, as well as to try to uh, try to hit on some new, uh, some new topics here um, or new uh, aspects of the material. Okay, so uh, I'm going to share the screen. There we go. Um, so uh, you'll recall um, from last time that uh, functors are these structure preserving maps um, that, that map objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms where um, the degrees of freedom we have in mapping a morphism from objects A and B in source category um, to the target category is limited by the fact that that morphism needs to, when it's moved over by the functor to the other category, um, uh, if we have a, let's say a morphism between A and B, um, when we have what A is mapped to by the functor, what B is mapped to by the functor, this morphism between A and B needs to be mapped to something between those two. Um, and as we saw, it also has to, uh, play nicely with uh, the structure of uh, the category. It has to kind of transport that structure over. So um, structure is captured in through composition um, within categories. So we have this uh, identity um, morphism, which is trans has to be transported to an identity morphism in D. That's, um, that's this, right? Um, a Identity morphism in A is transported to an identity morphism on the object to which A is mapped. And then it has to preserve composition. So um, it has to honor the composition. So we can either, if we have two morphisms over here in the source category, we can either compose them and then map. Um, that's this H after F, and we can map that over. Uh, or uh, alternatively, we could map uh, F over and then map H over and compose them over here in D in the other category. And if we compose them there, oh, we will get um, that same morphism. Okay. Um, so uh, this was the basic idea of, of uh, functors. And um, uh, we talked about 
you know, some subtleties uh, associated with it um, in terms of the mappings. One thing that came out in the discussion with, um, in lecture was, you know, the point that, um, well, in a Haskell context, uh, in a context where C here is Hask, a sort of pseudo category for Haskell, and D is Hask, um, it's easy to fall into the habit of thinking about these morphisms as functions. They needn't always be functions for an arbitrary category. They might not be functions. They might be order relations. You might say A is less than or equal to B, or may say A evenly divides B, uh, or that there's a path from A to B, or what have you. Um, so um, it bears noting that these are these morphisms um, could be functions, but might be other things. And you may um, be puzzled in that sense by why in um, the uh, category, uh, the discussion of, of functor formally, um, uh, while David Spivak was, um, was eager to make sure that he never wrote function where in fact it would be a more general the term morphism was needed. Um, he actually did leave the word function at two places. One is for the mapping of objects. There's a function that maps an object in one category to an object in another category. Um, that's what F does. And secondly, the mapping of morphisms is, he, he called that a function. Um, mapping from morphisms in C to morphisms in D, um, the target category. Um, and I wanted to, to ask you, um, was that a mistake or was there a reason that those are functions? He didn't have to say a morphism mapping an object from, from, um, from object in A or in object in C to objects in D. Why, did, why was it that he said uh, a function? Anyone? Why would that be a function? Hmm. Wade. Well, my thought is it's it's a one to one mapping. So, like each morphism in C must be mapped to a morphism in D. And it can't be mapped to multiple morphisms. That's right. That's right. It it there could be multiple items. The term one to one is actually confusing in mathematics. Um, um, it, it it sounds straightforward, but it's it's actually um, it's used. It, at least it seems to me it's used, and I've heard other people say this in in two different ways that are a little bit one sh sort of more specific than the other. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it is true that for every object in C, it needs to be mapped to, to some object in D. And each object in C can only be mapped to one object in D. Um, that's exactly right. And that sounds a lot like a function. And it, in fact, it is a function. So the set of objects within C there's a set of objects in C and a set of objects in D, at least if uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of wiggle, wiggle around. I'm a computer scientist, not a mathematician. You know, I, I, maybe it has, maybe it requires C and D to be small categories. And that, that's fine. If you wanna say these have to be small categories, I'm perfectly happy saying they're small categories. Um, but, um, you know, that there's a set of, um, if there's a set of objects, uh, in one, a set of objects in the other. It's a it's a function. It's a function between those sets. How about the morphisms? Why do we use the term function for morphisms? Uh, for this mapping of morphisms. Because we are dealing with what? With mapping from one what to another. One, one of what in C to 
to that same thing uh, to one of those things in D. It's a hum set, and it's a set. It's a set. Um, so uh, mapping of morphisms, it maps a member of this HOM set between A and B. That's a set. It's a set of all morphisms A to B. They may, be, may not be functions, but there's a set of those morphisms. And we map those over into the set of morphisms between F of A and F of B. There might be many of those already there, but, but each one over here in C has to go to one of those. Um, between f of a and you know f uh, where a is brought to and where b is brought to um so those are mappings between hom sets mapping from this hom set between a and b to the hom set between f a and f b All right so those are genuine functions um even though i said mapping it's uh, we could say functions at least if it's uh, mumble small mumble mumble uh, okay, um, so functors. Um, and the picture generally looks a bit like this. Um, uh, so, you know, um, I don't think um, I'll go into too much detail about it, except, you know, to say that there's again this interpretation, this intuition that stirred up and, um, David Spivet talks um, about different ways you might might think about you know C being interpreted by the functor in D, or um, D being sort of an abstraction or an embedding, having an C embedded in it. Um, and Bartosz speaks about kind of going you know one functor mapping it over to a plane and another functor mapping it to a different plane, for example, in D. Um, uh, there's a notion of functoriality, um, uh, a mapping that preserves structure um, according to rules of a, of a functor, and that it has this nice composition property said to be to have functoriality associated with it. It's functorial in its, its nature. It has this sort of ability to compose it, and it's a mapping that preserves that composition, that honors it. It's kind of well behaved. Um, okay, um, right, um, uh, right, and and so I, 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 it looks like I was correct. I went and did homework on this at one point. It's small categories. Um, if C is a small category and D is a small category, we have a mapping from objects to objects that's a function. And I, I think there may be a, a notion of uh, locally small for. Hom sets being sets. Um, that's also required to talk about mapping of morphisms. Um, and mathematicians can get up, you know, really excited about these things. Uh, okay. Um, you know, just a little bit of elaboration on that. Um, you know, if we had additional morphisms here between A and B from the Hom set of AB. Um, they're going to all be mapped into different elements of the hum set of F A F B. This this side here. So this is the mapping of F, and this is the map uh, here, and this is the mapping of G, right? And they're all going to be kind of siblings over here. If they were siblings over here between A and B, they're all going to be siblings over here. Um, now we might, what's not being shown here is we might collapse things down. And we'll see this for some of our examples. There might be a collapsing down whereby the functor maps multiple things onto the same thing. Uh, um, multiple objects onto the same object, for example. And multiple morphisms, maybe onto the same morphism, like the identity. Um, okay. Um, now, I, I did want to talk about some sort of famous functors. Uh, so you may 
remember some of these from the discussion group. Um, one of them is one that two of them David Spivak uh, introduced in the lecture. One is a constant functor. And this is kind of like a brute force functor. Um, it maps any object in C into a single object in D, regardless of what is mapping. Um, just ignores its input, its argument, whatever you want to call it, and it just bullheadedly gives you the single object D. So, you know, it turns all sets, maybe it's a functor from set to set that turns every set, you know, maps it to foo and the set of foo and bar. Um, I think that was David's example. Um, uh, and, and that's nice for the objects, but you got to specify what it does to, to morphisms. And uh, the common choice here for constant functors is um, all morphisms in C are mapped to the identity morphism. So we have you know, multiple objects coming, being mapped to the same object. Um, and because they're all mapped to one object, I should have a nice pretty picture of this. Uh, because they're all mapped to one object, um, we got to do something with the morphisms between the original ones, right? Um, so if we had A mapped to FA and B mapped also to FA, now we have F. And what are we going to do with F? Oh, man. Um, well, you know, it's it'd be kind of hard to define in general if it was very persnickety and it required a certain self loop here for a, for a self arrow, um, an arrow going from FA to FA. Um, you know, uh, it, it kind of would be hard to define it in general, constant functor. So instead, we, we map it to the identity. The identity is always present. That's going to be a key point we're going to come back to. Um, it's going to help deal with the Yoneda, Yoneda trick uh, and play a nice role in our study of the link between our junctions and monads. But the constant functor um, defined in general can always map if it's collapsing down to a single object, can always map any morphism between you know, these objects down to the identity because we know it exists. So we'll just map it to the identity. So that's how the constant functor is defined. Um, kind of like goes to a black hole. Everything goes to it and all the morphisms go to the identity morphism and all the objects go to the same object. Boom. You know, the morphism go to the identity morphism on that object. Yeah, um, sounds kind of boring, but it's very useful. Um, it's a constant functor. Um, the identity functor is, is a very important citizen of the functor world. Um, and one might say it's an upstanding and even an essential citizen um, because uh, it is needed to talk about categories of categories, um, which David Spivak mentioned, where we have categories as objects, and we have morphisms between them, which are what? Do you remember what David Spivak said? If we have a category of small categories, um, um, the morphisms between them are what? They are if, if each object is a category, what are the morphisms between them? They are functors. Functors. They're functors. They're structure preserving mappings. That's what morphisms are. Their job in life is to be these nice, nice mappings. Um, and um, are these nice relationships. Um, so the when we have this uh, category of small categories where the objects are small categories and the morphisms are, are functors, um, uh, the role of 
identity morphisms are played by identity functors. What does an identity functor do? A given object is mapped to what? Can anyone say? It's mapped to, to what? What is it mapped to? What has it got to be mapped to? For you to do it many times, it'll be the same as not doing it at all or doing it once. An object is mapped to a, to itself. Now, identity functor has got a map from C to C. A given object in C is mapped to another, to, a, to an object in C. What my object is mapped to? It's mapped to itself. Kind of why it's identity. If you keep on doing it, it'll just map to itself, map to itself, blah, blah, blah. Um, morphisms in C are lifted over into C to themselves. Just maps themselves to themselves. Um, and, and so when you compose functors, this is identity. You compose it with any other functor and you get that other functor back. back. Then we'll talk about the diagonal functor here, um, uh, which will which will um, map from C to uh, C cross C to sort of a, a product of of of, of objects. Um, it maps from morphisms to a, to a pair of morphisms. You could say this is a pair of, I should say, pair of of objects. An object is mapped to a pair of objects and a morphism is mapped to a pair of morphisms. Um, so this is uh, another type that's actually very, very common. Um, okay, so this is based on what's called a product category. Um, so if we have a category C, you can have a product category that basically pairs of things. So we have an object here, A, we have another one, B, another C, and another D. And so this product category C cross C has, you know, it has a A cross A somewhere. It has a A cross B somewhere. Um, and I see a B cross A, there's A cross B. Okay. Every pair of things here has got to appear here. And there's a link between them. If there are links um so there's a link from one cross another to another cross another um if there's links from both so for example from a cross c that's this guy here there's a link to uh, b cross b why because we can go with f uh, on the first part and g on the other part f on the first part that's a to B and G and the other from C to B. Mm, that's that guy. Um, so this is a, you can think of these as kind of pairs. It, it may stick in your craw that they are, you know, times, but um, you can think of them as pairs, kind of they're, you know, a pair of A and C, a pair of B and B, uh, the, the pairs of objects you know, right here that are here. These are pairs of morphisms. Now, um, and and so there's this this category here has this sort of structure. It's every object is, is a pair of objects from the original category. And the job of the diagonal functor is it's going to map map over something like oh when i had a nice picture of it oh no did i not put it oh no did i not put it in here okay let's go see maybe it's ah there we are uh oh no no this is the this is, this is another one that didn't get in there um uh so uh here um we would have hask and we would have uh, hask cross hask uh and for example we could and we return an object in Hask, say a type, let's say int into a pair of types. Let's say int and int. Um, so it would, you know, here A is is a, is a object in C. So that's that's going to be int. 
and then we turn it into a pair of int comma int. So it's going to take that, or we have a double, and it's going to turn it into double comma double, or we have a float and float comma float, or bool and bool comma bool. And then morphisms. Well, if we have a, a morphism from you know into bool. It says whether it's negative. Um, then we can get a morphism from int comma int, a pair of int, two ints, to a pair of two bools by just applying that function to the first of them and to the second of them. Mm. Um, sounds fancier than it really is, but this is kind of a diagonal functor. And if you're wondering why is that a functor, well, you can think about it. Um, what would the identity, so to be a functor, you have to have some components and you have to adhere to some conditions. So what we specified here is the, the two elements that define it, object where objects are mapped to, where morphisms are mapped to. What properties does this have to adhere to? Anyone? To be a functor, to be a, a honest to goodness functor, what does it need to do? It needs to map what to what? First of all, I appreciate you letting me eat my belated lunch, but surely someone could uh, cut off or hazard a guess. What could it do? Hazarding a guess is easier than guessing a hazard rate, as we know. Um, well, so what would I what would identity be? What would an identity morphism? Remember, the rules of functors are all about preserving structure, right? Um, they're, they're, they're all about preserving structure and structure is captured in kind of two big ways. It's captured, well, really it's captured through composition and composition has to have this nice identity morphisms. So what's the identity morphism here um, for a diagonal functor? What would be an identity morphism um, that would be mapped from C? And C, you have uh, identity identity morphism. What would it be mapped to? To what would it be mapped? It would be mapped to what? Um, is it to a pair of identity morphisms? Pair of identity morphisms, yeah. Pair of identity morphisms. And what does composition do? So composition, well, it's composition of morphisms in C, you could imagine that, and it needs to be honored. So we need to be able to do it in C and then map over to, to C cross C. Um, or we need to be able to map first to C cross C and then compose. What would composition be in C cross C? So suppose you add a pair uh, of functions, um, uh, F, you know, F and I'll, I'll say here for simplicity, F and F and G and G, what would they comp compose to? Anyone? Uh, would it be G after F and G after F? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, now, the thing you have to, I was actually being a bit glib there because C cross C is not limited to pairs like F, things that have the same exact object. Those are the ones that are introduced by the functor. But there's other things in here that are, that are not going to be of that form. Um, uh, like F cross G is going to be in here. That isn't of the form F, you know, F paired with F. Um, 
everything that's transported over from here um, would be would be of that form. Um, uh, it will go from F to F comma F. But there might be things already here that are of a different form. So like if I if I use the identity functor to map A over it, it'll go to A cross A. If I use it to map B over, it'll go to B cross B. If I use it to map F over, it'll go to F cross F. Great. Over here in um, C cross C. But it would be a mistake to think everything in C cross C is of that form. Um, those that are mapped over by the functor are, but then there might be, there were going to be in general some things here that are not in that form. And you have to talk about composing those. And unfortunately, this is a, a impoverished example um, because there's just not a lot of interesting composition that can happen. I'll have to modify this but uh i was hoping you know you could go like this and then down like this or something but it looks like this is one way in here so there's not a lot of composition we could talk about but if you had you know something going like to this guy that was i cross j or something like that you could compose you know it'll be like i i after f and j after g it will come down like this with G first and then J or F first and then I. Um, so composing within this product category is, is readily done by just composing sort of pairwise. Um, okay, um, great. Uh, right, 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 right. Okay, um, so I had asked you before we get into some details on, on, on the Haskell side of it. Um, I had asked you to do some thinking through um, some of these uh, examples uh, that, uh, that I posed to you. Um, and uh, maybe what I'll do is save this and create a, a new one here. Um, but I had asked you, for example, uh, to, well, um, you know, reason about, for example, uh, if we had, you know, a category which had, let's say, and this wasn't probably one of them, but if, if I had this, uh, it's going to test the same sort of reasoning you built up and you had something like this. Um, and we want to ask what are all functors over into this uh, this other category. So here's one category. Um, oh, that this doesn't that look horrible. Um, okay, uh, that's well, it still ain't great, but um, it is a little cowlick there. Okay, um, and here's another category. Um, okay, so if we had this, um, tell me the. You, you've thought through these examples now, so you should be able to tell me uh, how many functors are there mapping from this guy to this guy? Anyone? What are the choices we have? What's one choice? You thought about this, so what's the choice? Um, we have total of five. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so what what would those be? Let's label each of these. Um, to be a bit less confusing, I'm going to, I'll say this is A, this is B, um, and we will call these over here um, one, two, and three. Okay. Um, okay. So, so do you want to list out? So we could do it in a in a table, as David Spiebeck uh, showed, right? So uh, we'd have two columns of the table: one saying where A is mapped to, and one saying where B is mapped to. Um, great. And so, what's the what's the first of the 
one, 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 one. Yeah, so one and I'm gonna see if I could do this better, but uh, um, let me let me just adjust this slightly. Okay, one and and then one. Okay, yeah. So A goes to one and B goes to one. And where does the funct where does this function go to? Um, to the identity. To identity. You notice I didn't draw any other, but identity is guaranteed to be there. If I had drawn another one, would that change how many there are? How many how many functors there are? If I suppose I had done this, I had drawn one in that's not the identity functor. It's just it's another funct. Oh, sorry, it's not the identity morphism in D. This is D, and this is C here. Um, uh, if um, I had done that, how, would that change the number of functors? Yeah, I think it should be two yeah. two functors. Yeah, there, there's one that maps A to this guy, uh, B to this guy, and this morphism to the identity. And then there's another one that maps A to this guy, B to this guy, and this this uh, morphism to this self identity, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's quite right. Okay, so let's continue on. Um, uh, so, uh, boom, boom, boom. Um, let's keep on editing this. Uh, okay. Um, so, what's what's another one? Um, two two. Two two. That's right. Um, it can map over there. And what happens to this morphism? It maps to the identity on two. Identity on two. It could also go to three three, right? Um, yeah. Um, okay. Now it gets more interesting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the other missing two? Could anyone else fill in? Shayan's led the way, um, but can anyone else um, fill in the the missing two? One to two, and then one to three. Yeah, exactly. One to two and one to three. Mm. And, you know, related to a question David got in, in lecture. Okay. Um, uh, why can't it map to, you know, why can't we have A map to three and B map to one? Why, why is that? It's because there's what? I'll make it very clear. It's because this guy, hey, oh man, um, um, but oh man, okay, deep forest green. Okay, there we go. Um, why why can't A go to three and B go to one? Because what? Anyone say in a pithy terms? There's no morphism from. Three to one. And there's no morphism for three to one. Um, if we had had such a morphism, then it opens up additional avenues. Um, uh, and let's 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 talk about that. Let's let's, let's, let's talk about that. Um, so maybe I'll I'll save this. Ooh, move. I'll save this one. But then we'll. Um, so. Uh, um, Mumble. Uh, let's create it in the wrong folder, but that's uh, that's fine. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna create a variant of this. Um, uh, so um, <laughs> most unimaginative name. Um, fine. Um, so suppose we had had another morphism there, um, which I'll sort of add in in a different color just to emphasize that. How would that change things? What, what would that change now? First of all, what, what could we have as an option? For sure. Three to one. Now, so we can have three to one. Map A to three, B to, uh, B to, oh, excuse me. Yeah, A to three, B to one, and this guy here to the blue, right? Um, so we could go blue. Um, oop. That's what I wanted to do. OK. 
Okay. Um, so we could do three to one. Yeah. Um, okay. Now it gets kind of interesting. So could could someone say let's let's give these names just so we're talking less abstractly. This is call this F and call this G. The one coming down is G. The one going back up is F. Um, um, is it possible that there are more hidden ones here? Um, for example, suppose I went, um, suppose I'm at three and I go F and then G and then F again. Is that a different one than the blue one or is that the same one and why? Suppose I compose F, so I start at three, compose F and G and then F again. Um, does that kind of create a new arrow option for mapping, you know, um, this one over here to J to which it can map K or is it, is it not a new arrow? Can anyone say? Um, I think it's a new arrow. It's the composition of the two morphism F and G. Okay, so let's sharpen it. Anyone want to put forward a, an alternative view? I'm going to tentatively say that it's not different. Uh, I'm not sure of that position, but uh, okay. I think because of composition, mm. if you if you mm. go from if you go from three to one and then back to three, it's like you never left three. Okay, and why is that? If you go, you're getting to the heart of the matter here. If you go to from three to one and then back to three, um, that's that's a composition of what? That's G after F, right? It's it's G composed with F, right? Um, so F fat semi G, if you prefer, um, or G circle F, if you want, right? Um, um, so what is G circle F? Um, so if we had, uh, if we had this, what is that? Is, is that a new morphism? Well, G circle F, if we compose things, remember part of the property of a category is composing any two morphisms has to give us another, another morphism that already exists, right? Um, so so, so we, we, have to, um, we have to have a morphism to which we identify that. Um, you know, the, the composition of any two morphisms uh, has, has uh, got to, to exist in the category. It has to exist in the category. Um, it, we, it can't just be non-existent, right? Um, so, so G after F here, um, where G after F is gonna yield a morphism uh, from from what to what? G after F is a morphism. What's its source? Where whence is it coming? Sort of from what from what uh, object is it coming? From three. three. And where is it going? Whither does it go? Three. Three. And to what? morphism are we going to identify it? With which morphism will we identify it? So we know this has to be 
one of the morphisms from three to three. How many of such morphisms are there? Just the identity in this example. Just the identity. That's there always. If we had drawn another one, if we had you know, drawn one like this, it would be a different picture. Then there's, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> tried to do magenta. Um, if, if there's another one like that, that, that needn't be the identity, in which case, um, then we're getting the potential for composition of G and F to yield something that's not identity. And uh, that gets interesting because then we could compose that with F again and get a, you know, get a, get a different one. Um, but because there's nothing from three to three, because this is only the identity implicitly, this actually needs to be the identity morphism here. This, is, this has to be the identity morphism because that's the only morphism from three to three. So you have to be a bit careful about this. Um, uh, in reasoning about, you know, if it ain't shown, if it's not shown, um, then there's nothing else there. So this is identity, identity sub three. Yeah. Um, and this is why, like, if you have a category here, a, a presentation of a category like, um, like this, uh, so we have a, you know, two objects and we have something like this, the number of morphisms is actually bounded. Um, you know, suppose we were to call this M and, and N or something. Um, implicitly, there are these, you know, there are these ones that, that go around here, right? Um, um, and let's get rid of those other two. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Um, there are these others. But like N and then M has got to be the same as this identity because there's none other draw. Um, that kind of limits what it can be. And it limits our degree of flexibility in saying, suppose we did M N, you know, one round trip. Now it's a different morphism. We do another one, another morphism, and, you know, and, and keep it on sort of generating implicit morphisms. No, the fact that, that there are no other morphisms mean that M composed with N has to be, um, has to give the identity. Um, and N composed with M has to be a dead identity, you know, either way. And what that means is that this kind of represents an isomorphism. I don't know if you remember, but when David Spivak or Brennan Fong in, you know, introduced these um, kind of exemplar categories, one, to um, the walking arrow, um, they introduced this as well. And they said it represented isomorphism. Um, uh, two things that, that were an isomorphism for each other. It's because this one composed with that one must be the identity because there's no other self-morphism. The picture would change totally if we had, whoop, if we had another, um, if we had an, oh, my the only self-morphism is, uh, is the identity here. If we had had another one, um, you know, and, and another one, then the picture, oh, gosh, uh, then the picture would be very different. Um, there'd, be, there'd be more options and N composed with M wouldn't have to be the identity and these two wouldn't have to be in, a, in an isomorphism. I don't know if that's helpful for thinking about it, but it, it's worth uh, worth thinking about, um, you know, reflecting on. Um, so, uh, Xiaoyan, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, I I I'm kind of confused. So, so if for example, if we have an extra um, morphism from I'm not sure A to A, mm. uh, except the 
um, the identity. Does that mean um, the two objects are still isomorphism or not? Um, if, okay, so um, are you talking about like A over here, this one? Oh, sorry, no, no, the, the, the red, uh, the magenta. The, the, the magenta, okay, yeah. yeah. So, so if we call this, um, let's, and now we're gonna, now we're gonna get in trouble. Um, suppose we called it uh, X and suppose we, oh, that's pretty. Um, and suppose we called this Y here. Okay. Um, so you were yes. saying if there's uh, an additional, like, uh, oh my gosh, an additional morphism like this? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So if we have this structure, um, should we still see X and Y are uh, 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 isomorphism? Um, Good question. Okay, so so let's think about this. Um, so, um, so would so let's let's start with y. If we did n, and then we did m, does that have to be a? Can that be anything, or 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 um, does it need to be the identity? Yeah, so that have to be the identity. Have to be the identity because there's no other choice of a self morphism. We have to identify it with some other morphism that already exists. Um, and what's that other morphism? Well, the only one that, that exists is, is that any good. Um, but how about this one? So that was that was M after N. Now suppose we're dealing with this one, which was we're starting at X. And um, we can do, you know, M and then N, right? Um, so, sorry, M and then N, right? Um, so, or N after M. So let's let's do this. N after M is something that starts at X. It's the only way we can do M first. And then it goes to Y and then we do N. Okay. Uh, uh, um, okay. Um, does that have to be identity now? No, because we have the No, belief. we have choice. We have choice here. So this would, this does not have to be the identity. Now we get to choose the composition rule within this freedom, right? Like we could choose a composition rule that um, where those two composed is the identity. Um, but it's not forced by the nature of the category um, because someone else or the presentation, because someone else might choose a composition rule for this compatible with the same presentation where N after M is this uh, blue arrow, in which case those are no longer in an isomorphism relationship. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that's kind of the the essence of it. Um, but this this is worth thinking about, you know, like what's implicit versus explicit. Um, you know, if if it's not shown, it doesn't exist there, um, uh, except for the things that are implied by category theory. You know, a composition has to exist. A identity morphism for a, a given object has to exist. Um, and, and that's worth reflecting on. I don't know if that's helpful, Shayan. Um, yeah, yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, other questions or confusions coming out of this sort of material? Did any of you find some of them really confusing to work through? Do you want me to go through any of them? Ah, Chayanne. Yeah, yes. um, 
I I have a confusion of the functor, but not this uh, in this material. So maybe I can ask later if some others have specific. Sure. Would anyone like to ask another question? And if not, we can we can uh, consider um, consider Xiao Yan's functor question. Um, yeah. So so I feel so for the functors. Till now, what we are talking about is, uh, if we would like to define functor, that means we 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 will we will have two categories. Then then we will define a functor between these two categories. A uh, two categories. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Can we think about if we have one category? Then if if I can define a functor, then can I find something like another category like? map from this one to another one. It's like, um, I'm not sure, a subjective or something. Um, I'm not sure oh. that's the right direction oh. to think about that. So are, are you are you talking about something like, um, OK, you have a category C, and you have a category D. And what you're talking about is, uh, I think that, um, you know, um, if we have these two categories here, um, Here's two categories. Um, and we have some objects over here in category C. Um, in general, category D could have lots of other objects, right? Um, uh, and, and I think what you're talking about is like, if we consider the rules for uh, a functor or whatever, um, these have various relations in them. Blah, blah blah over here, um, etc. Um, uh, so uh, you know, in general, this will sort of map over um, in a uh, you know. Here we go. It'll map maybe that to that. And it'll map this to this. And it'll map this one to this one. But those are just a few things in a sea of different, in a sea of these different ones, right? Um, and maybe what you're asking is, Xiaoyan, um, mm -hmm. um, is it almost like, could we create a category D or something? Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it's the things that C maps to with this functor or something like yeah. that. It like yeah, the right. functor induces the category. Yeah. Um, and and instead of dealing with this whole darn shebang over here, we have a you know sort of a a, a narrow slice of this that is created by you know the uh, the functor. It's just the morphisms and the objects created by the functor, induced by the functor, generated by the functor. Um, uh, this is a, a really good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, when I started to think about functors, one of the mistakes I was making in my head, it turns out, was uh, I was thinking about functors as doing that. In other words, like, like they induce new categories um, by by occurring, but you know it, it's evident in the time since then that you know functors are much more commonly thought of uh, almost again as embedding C and D or interpreting C and D. It just goes into a piece of D, right? And and often we we consider different functors to map it to different pieces of D. Um, so this functor might have mapped it to those. And uh, this other functor maps it into, oh my gosh, um, here we go. Um, this other functor maps it to, oh no, I'm in a, in a pickle. Oh my gosh. Um, but it maps it to, um, to uh, some other ones. Um, and uh, and so we could um, we could say yeah each of them carves out a piece and um, of this I 
Um, I, you know, I, I don't know that. I, yeah, I, um, there's all these, you know, uh, additional categorical notions um, uh, that can be layered atop of this. And maybe one of them includes this functionality. Does anyone happen to know off the top of your head if you heard about anything like that? Uh, if not, that might be something to look into, Sha, yeah. You know, kind of an induced category that's almost defined by virtue of what the functor maps to. It's like the image of the functor, right? It's, it's, it's like the, um, we say the image of, of the functor. Um, when we talk about a function, um, uh, we, we talk about its domain and its range, um, you know, with a function, it's going from some set, um, I'm going to draw this. Um, so with a function, this is going to be a, a little set here. And I'm going to say, you know, uh, turtle, what was Brendan's example? Turtle, um, uh, goat, and then there was another one. I can't remember what it was. Some, maybe it was fish or something. I, I don't remember. Um, uh, but it was another type of animal. And here's one set. So this is a set. And here's another set. And maybe this is, you know, um, the age of the animal in years. You know, um, one, two, three. It's newborn. It's whatever. Um, and maybe turtle goes to this one. Let's do that colorful. We might as well make it make it less ugly at least. Okay. Hey. Oh man. Um, okay. Now I've missed my chance. Um, and maybe this one is one years old as well. And oh my. <laughs> okay. Now I'm really in trouble. Um, so here we might have uh, a mapping uh, between these two um, uh, that only occupy some of these. And we talk about the image of, this is some function f, and we talk about the image of the function being um, just the, uh, you know, the actual things that it maps from, from other sets. Like maybe with other sets, yeah, it would, it's only going to map to a to a small subset of this of this set of possibilities, and we so this is the this is the maybe the domain of the function, um, and this is the range of the function. Um, the map, function maps any one of these to some value here, and the set of all values to which it maps um, within the range is called the image of that function. And I think, Shalyan, what you're talking about is the image of the functor, right? Yeah, but I'm not sure whether it's the right direction yeah. of a, how to use a functor. So. Right. Um, I'm, not, um, I'm not sure either. Um, I'd, I'd encourage looking into that because um, I think that's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Okay, well, we're, we're over time now. Anyone have a burning discussion or, or question you want to bring to the table? Somehow it goes really quick. Or let me ask this. Um, I need some feedback. Are you folks feeling... Um, good enough about where we're at in the course and in your appreciation material that you're ready to take on natural transformations. Then the next lecture, which will expand on what David Spivak said for natural transformations um, this time and, and go on and, um, you know, expand our, our understanding of natural transformations, um, these mappings between functors. That will hinge quite a bit on an understanding of, of categories and functors and, and kind of um, tie it together. It's the last of the triad of sort of the 
absolutely essential, you know, central concepts, essential central concepts. And there's this notion of a commuting square, which David referred to, where if you go this way, it's the same as going this way. Um, are you feeling up for that? Or would you rather, you know, uh, explore some of these concepts some more that we've just been talking about? Um, you know, spend a little bit more time dwelling on functors and so on before we go on for, for uh, natural transformations. What are people thinking? Would they like to try some more examples? Anyone want to comment on this? Hmm. I actually had a few questions arising out of the last lecture, which I'll uh, will probably take a while, so I'll save them for another time. But uh, it, it might be nice to clear that up first. Uh, good. Okay. So here's an idea. Maybe for Friday, we could have a discussion section, no new material, no new lecture contents, no new videos. Uh, instead, we'll talk over some of these things and, and try Try like some additional examples, et cetera. Okay, I'm, I'm getting vote of confidence. Um, I'm also seeing some neat discussion um, from, uh, uh, yeah. So this is interesting, Alex, some of Alex's comments um, uh, on, on sort of, it, it looks like something out of, applicatives or something. I can't remember if that's called splat. I, I, I can't remember, Alex, you would know. But um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, uh, so what, what did people think about the idea of having a discussion on Friday? No new materials, we'll just talk it over. Is that good? Awesome. So, so come, come with your questions, come with your um, Come with your, you know, confusions, your requests, et cetera, and I'll see if um, if we can grapple with them, and we'll grapple with them together. Okay. Great. I appreciate the feedback. That's super, super helpful. And meeting Monday, Wednesday, Friday like this, we do have latitude. There's no issues that we're going to run out of, you know, be unable to to capture the canon of the course. We actually have considerable latitude. Um, but more importantly, the goal is really to build understanding here. So, um, um, you know, let's let's use this to cement our understanding before making that push to this this next peak, which is natural transformations. Um, so let's let's cement our understanding first. Okay, awesome. So I will see you folks on Friday, and my recollection is. That Friday, um, we are meeting at, uh, I think it's 11 o'clock Friday, which, yes, comes right after another presentation of mine. Um, so uh, it's possible I'll be a couple of minutes uh, late for that. But uh, 11 o'clock Friday, the same, same Zoom meeting. Great. Thank you. And be sure to do a reflection on what you'd like to talk about so we can get some questions addressed. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care there and have a great rest of the day.